Hi, good morning, Fiatech members and Fiatech friends, and a happy Tuesday to all of you. I'm Nicole Testa Boston, the Deputy Director at Fiatech, and I'm very glad that you're all able to join us this morning for Fiatech's weekly Technology Tuesday webinar series. Today we have an exciting hour set aside to learn about the iRing software and Camelot project, which was just released on Friday. Robin Benjamins is going to be presenting this work to us. Robin Benjamins, who I'm sure most of you already know, he is the engineering automation manager at Bactil and has been leading the ISO 15926 Camelot project since January of this year. It's been a fast track project. We've estimated close to $880,000 of in-kind hours between 11 different developers from nine different companies and we're all very proud of the work that they've done and looking forward to hearing Robin explain that in more detail. He also has Rob DiCarlo from Bechtel, Noj Darwood Carr from Bentley Systems and Julian Bourne from NRX on the line and on audio and they will be assisting with the presentation as well as answering questions. So with that, thank you all and thank you Robin and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, I guess good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're located. Um, I'm just going to start to go right down through this uh, presentation. Some of these slides you probably have seen. I've used uh, certain ones at uh, various conferences and whatnot. So the first one is just to explain uh, uh, what 5096 is. I'll go ahead and just unfold this um, and where iRing fits into the picture. So uh, the main thing is it's about 5096, and iRing is uh, an adapter technology that was that the project built to implement the full specification of 5096. And as you can see on the diagram, um, the adapters itself sit uh, against or uh, attached to um, various uh, source application systems from various companies. Um, and uh, it's made up of a mapping solution with some transformation and a, an interface which is called the 5096 facade, uh, which actually happens to be uh, technically what's called a triple store. Um, and uh, to make the whole thing work, of course, we use the 5096 uh, specifications and reference data, which is de depicted by the series of uh, databases. This is actually how it's distributed. Um, and all of this is exposed to the Internet. And uh, iRing, as a concept, is um, um, is yeah a a peer to peer system that sits on the internet to allow the interoperation of information between companies or systems. Okay, so uh, fifty nine six itself uh, has many parts to it, and the parts I've listed here are uh, are kind of the main parts, you would say. Um, so part two, we're going to use an analogy to compare it to natural language. So part two is the data model of the standard, and it's kind of equivalent to uh, the concept of a grammar for a natural language, such as English has grammar. It, it uh, specifies things in there uh, like verbs and nouns and whatnot. Um, so it's in a very similar role. Uh, the reference data, part four, that is like a dictionary, and part four has been um, uh, in use for quite some time, um, and it's an area where a lot of uh, people are, are actively working on it, expanding it. It's, it's, today it's 10,000 ISO classes combined with 50,000 uh, post-seizure association classes that make up the, the whole of the reference data. And it's a uh, kind of an organic piece. It continues to grow with as as 5096 is used in various industry domains. So there's new concepts that need to be modeled and, and put into classes. Uh, the next concept is part seven, which is templates. And one way to think of it, it's a way of organizing information. So you can say it's phrases, sentences, paragraphs, so on and so forth. Um, then the next uh, part, part eight, is about an implementation, which is based on RDFL, which is actually a semantic web standard by the W3C. And it's kind of the media, think about it, the paper, the book, the website, um, TV, movie, whatever it may be, whatever the media may be. Uh, and part nine is uh, the uh, implementation aspect of the web services and the triple stores, and that's what we call the facades. So it's kind of how you read the information. It's the reading aspect of 5926. So iRing as an implementation 
uh, wraps all of these aspects, all of these parts, and uh, is driven to be as fully compliant um, as possible. Okay, the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about was uh, what we see as a real pain point. It's, it's information ambiguity. And the way to think of it is that ambiguity equals cost, so the more you have of it, the more money you're spending to uh, reduce it. And if we map onto the scale of least ambu ambiguity to, to greatest, uh, 1596 it's, six itself, it has various levels of compliance. And if I stick on there some existing technologies, you know, common to the file is very generic, very, very ambiguous, and it's, it's very uh, low on the scale, so it's got a lot of ambiguity, so we spend a lot of effort, time, trying to figure out what is this information in this common blended file. Uh, then there's uh, another reference point is XM Plant. It's a very well-established uh, schema, um, and it does use um, dictionary compliance of 5096, so it starts to enter into this compliance stack. Then we have uh, I-Ring, what we have today, I-Ring 1.0. Uh, the difference between these two I-Ring versions is really that uh, the, a later version of I-Ring will include this ability, what's called lifting. And for lifting to fully work, we need to have the modeling fully developed underneath, and that will take some time, though that'll be in our future. That will, in essence, achieve the, the highest level of compliance and the least amount of ambiguity. It's where we get to leverage the highest precision of, of the 5096 standard. So it is our goal, it's where we're headed for, but we get a significant jump on this ambiguity reduction, i.e. cost reduction, um, by using uh, iRing 1.0. And another way to look at this is uh, uh, the transition from data to knowledge, that as you go up this stack and implement 1596, you're transitioning out of a, uh, you know, a data-centric way into a more of a knowledge-centric uh, way of managing information. Okay, so uh, this slide depicts the, uh, um, yeah, the process of developing the, the reference data itself, and there's a top-down and bottom-up uh, aspect to it, both of which are part of 1596. So in this case, uh, historically, there's been many, many, many workshops over 15 years of time to not only develop the reference data, but actually the specification itself, the methodologies and whatnot. And if you ever participate in these workshops, at times it's kind of bewildering because of the type of conversations that occur, and uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of arguing going on as well. A lot of passionate folks come in there. Uh, these folks that, that do participate in this, though, are typically our own domain experts, like a mechanical engineer uh, or uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and when, when this process takes off, it's what's allowed the buildup of that huge amount of reference data we have today, but it tends to be debate-driven. So it's, it's about really refining the standard and uh, making it right. On the other end, we have our projects that we execute where the focus down here is we need to move data. So the folks that, that typically engage in these activities are also a part of our companies that are involved in projects, and they have a different driver. There the driver is, okay, it's great, but we need to move it. So this is more business driven on this side. Together, these two work together. The, the results of the workshops feed the implementations, and the implementations provide the, the use cases for the workshops. But the key is that these two are kind of decoupled from each other. There's no, um, there's, there's a natural opportunity to leverage each other, but there's no actual dependency between them. So they're both good, they they're both are necessary, but we can solve we can attack the problem from the two different ends. All right, for uh, this is a, a bit of a uh, perspective from Bechtel. Um, we see uh, 1596 as a as a lingua franca. It's it's the the language of languages, and uh, the way we think of it is that uh, if if you look at the various standards I've shown at the bottom. And considering all the systems we have, we would have to build interfaces that could properly interpret these different forms. And that would be a significant amount of effort to build all those interfaces. So what we've decided to do instead is build a single interface, which is what iRing is providing us, um, that could read and write um, or represent our information in a 5096 form that then are some specialty uh, transformation adapters uh, probably built on iRing technology 
that will then convert from its form into these various forms. And over time, some companies that we work with, like a joint venture partner, may also be using iRing, so it's just a native 5096 exchange of information. The other aspect of uh, 5096 is it's not just data or schematic information, it's actually the geometry. So it's spatial, it's life cycle, it's relationship data, it's all of those things, all these things that we know we need today to satisfy not just the data exchange of information, but uh, reporting, integration of information, and so on and so forth. Also the handover of information. Okay, uh, this slide is something I've built to kind of show, um, explain uh, you know, implementation from an investment standpoint. So when we consider these things, we have our technology side, and this tends to dominate our, our thinking. Uh, we typically think, oh, we'll go use brand X and it'll solve all our problems. But really what it is, is it's really these three. There's an information model, which is a bit of the new thing that's happening with 5926 for us as an implementer. Uh, and then there's the application mapping. You, you're mapping our systems onto the model. But from an investment standpoint, the, typically this is going to be made of commercial software or proprietary like Bechtel Built or open source or a mixture of the three. But this tends to always change. We are always updating this. So from an investment standpoint, we have to make that investment, but it's hard to, to reuse that investment. Now, when we look at the information model, we've learned that it's best to do that in the public because we need to interoperate between companies. So it's not a good idea to make a proprietary model that's only useful within Bechtel. We want to use it across on our joint venture projects, and it makes sense with the suppliers and our customers. So the, the aspect of this is that it's always extending. It's always extending to cover um, um, new business needs, such as uh, nuclear industry is starting to look at 5926, and that will drive extensions of classes and templates and whatnot uh, in the model. The application mapping is proprietary because it, it contains our IP, and it's, a, it's very specific to the various systems we have. So there is some uh, change. Uh, so from an implementation standpoint, this is a significant investment uh, for us, but we want to reuse it. So the key aspect there is that it always be compatible. So as the technology changes, we want to make sure that our investment in the map and in the model will we'll be able to reuse going forward. And that that is a, um, a, this is an aspect of iRing. It's, it's a guarantee that the iRing map itself will be forward compatible. Um, and uh, in 596, the nature of the, of the reference data itself is very reliable. You, it, it's a very solid investment to, to make. Okay, so um, for the uh, another aspect of 596, it's really kind of a dominant piece, is the fact that it's a, it's a model-driven approach to interoperability. So this, this slide I'm going to slowly build out, and you could see uh, how this sort of works together with the technical implementation. So here we have our domain experts, and they are experts on all of the various types of information we have. And what we're doing with them is getting them to model that information. And that's a, a rigorous process, and it's, uh, they're, uh, it's, it's a bit different than what we've done in the past, um, but it's highly reusable and um, it really forms the foundation of 1596. So that model is stored in RDS WIP. Again, it's a distributed system that sits on the internet, and it can also sit inside your company. It can even sit on your laptop if you want. Uh, where we do have other standards, we want to harmonize them and add the mappings between 1596 reference data and those standards to facilitate a, a, a more highly automated way to, to transform between them, to represent across the various other standards. So this is what we consider the information modeling dimension. Then we move on to the, the technical side. So here we have a, a system of any kind with its schema. It could be proprietary, it could be by vendor, it could be some other standard. And here's another system from some other company or even within your company. Again, different configuration. Then we have a technical implementation, so that's represented by the red. And inside that is the 15926 neutral format. So what there are, there is, these are these adapters with the T. That T represents transformation. This is what iRing is. It'll, it will convert, transform the 
representation from one system into this neutral format, which allows you to go to any other system back and forth. Now, this this uh, transformation is driven by the model and by a map, so it's the application mapping uh, that's a real key part of this uh, process. So that's the implementation dimension, and if I stick back on that investment aspects, so here is the information model that's in here. The application mapping is part of the adapters, um, and the technology, that's the commercial proprietary open source or mixture thereof. Okay, so for uh, 5926, uh, we've, we've, we, through our participation in many organizations and in the conferences, we know that uh, people come here are interested in it because they want to solve their data exchange problem. But because 5926 is based on an information modeling approach, that what happens is that um, um, you're, you're actually setting yourself up to leverage a lot more aspects, not just data exchange. So once you're in the 5926 uh, tent or circus, depending on how you see it, uh, you're able to use that information model to do lifecycle information integration, cross-application reporting, analysis, visualization, and a lot of other aspects to get to your knowledge. So this is really uh, a very powerful thing, and it really, I would say, is a bit of a, a paradigm shift for, for all of us in that we're, 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 we're changing our viewpoint on, on information itself. Because the, the one thing I've, I've noticed over the years is we do tend to model processes a lot. Uh, it's kind of a key aspect of, of, for example, like Six Sigma, where we model processes. And if you look at a lot of the software uh, practices that are out there, it's about modeling processes. But we don't really model information. And it, we, it's kind of, we take it for granted. And that has worked, but we're, we're missing an opportunity to really improve productivity by addressing that information as it sits in between our systems. And that, I think that's the real benefit of this information model approach. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about Camelot itself, uh, what the objectives were of the project. And uh, there were really three. The first was uh, to, to develop a, a, an information model. Um, and we're, what was different about this is that the specification for part seven uh, was released in December of 2008. So it allowed us to use the template methodology um, in, in this building of this information model. So it's, it's another aspect of the reference data uh, that exploits all those classes that, that have been built up over the years. Um, and we see this as sort of the beginning of this information model that will continue to grow the, the more it gets used by companies. Um, then the, the second objective was, of course, to develop open source software, uh, which is the, in the form of the iRing uh, adapter and editors that were built. Um, and we wanted to do it to show, number one, this is how you implement 1596 in software, so that's kind of a benefit to software develop, development companies. Um, and the other time, uh, other aspect is to provide an actual solution you could run with. So you could use this stuff in your business today. That's that's the other part of this, and I think that's kind of a key a key aspect of Camelot to um, to turn that corner from um, development of the standard into actually using it. Uh, the last objective was to demonstrate it. Now the demonstration did not occur at the end of the development of iRing. It occurred during the middle of it. So that, that did create a bit of a challenging schedule for all of us um, to put this project together and uh, meet the, the goals of the demonstration with, with, in essence, beta, maybe even alpha software. Um, so it really, um, yeah, I would say I was very impressed with the software, all the software de developers that were engaged in the project. So in all of this, um, um, had to end on May 29th. I think for me that was the biggest thing was uh, want to make sure that this project had an end date and it, and it did end on that day, and that's what it did. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the companies that participated uh, in Camelot are the following. Um, if, I, if I was to break this down, um, um, Bechtel, ben, uh, sorry, Bechtel, CCC, 
um, Hatch, TCS, and Zachary were the companies that were involved in the uh, software development. So they really did have the bulk of the work in front of them. Uh, the other companies were pretty much involved in the demo and the development of the storyboard, uh, and also were involved in an, an oversight to, uh, um, you know, the, to make sure that uh, the, the goals of the project make sense and all of that, and we were meeting our objectives. Okay, the project as a, a team, yeah, worked around the clock, uh, around the globe. It was truly 24-7 operation. Uh, there were many, many, many sessions where guys were up till three, four in the morning working on the code and handing off code, um, you know, sort of the follow the sun um, that was uh, clearly in play on this project. Um, and even the demo itself, uh, it occurred in Las Vegas. Uh, the first one happened at like 6 p.m. in Las Vegas, which turned out to be 3 a.m. in Athens. So CCC had to get up real early in the morning to, uh, to participate in that. It uh, felt kind of bad for that, but that's just the nature of the planet, I guess. It's round. Okay, the, the timeline of the project. The project was conceived in early November. And it was kicked off on January 13th, 2009. And we pretty much had a blank slate in front of us. So first order of business was get the software developers up and running because of that April 6th demo. And, uh, and then in parallel, we kicked off the storyboard team to start working on what exactly were we going to demo from a use case perspective. And, um, and also, you know, go over with all the demo logistics and whatnot. So as we came into April 6th into Las Vegas, uh, we did do the demo. I, I, in my opinion, it was very successful. All of our, all of our intended uh, data flows worked and uh, as, as planned. Uh, then when we came out of the, um, uh, the demo, of course, there were still roughly two months to go. Uh, and I think a lot of people thought, okay, it's done. But no, it was 60% done. The project had to complete and deliver to, to in essence, the world, iRing 1.0, the first version of it, and it, it is, that has been achieved, and it's transitioning into the open source process. We expect, as companies begin to use it, that they will either um, identify either bugs or enhancements, or actually work on them and submit them into uh, the control board that will be set up shortly to manage the code going forward. Okay, so again, iRing as a concept, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, solution. In fact, even the reference data itself is a part of that peer status. And uh, even the way it's designed, if the reference data, for whatever reason, went offline suddenly, it would not prevent the, the iRing solution from working. And the reason for that is that the, uh, the specific scope of information exchange uh, it, that footprint against the model is actually copied into the mapping uh, system within the iRing adapter. So, uh, and iRing, yeah, it forms on the internet by, by the fact that two companies are up and running and that kind of starts growing this thing outward. Uh, the other aspect of 5926 is that, uh, at least for us, we've always had an internal focus towards it. We, we, we saw it as a very good solution, the right solution, to solve a lot of our internal interoperability problems. It's, you know, the life cycle aspect, the, the relationship data, and all of that. So um, we, we approached this with, okay, we'll, we'll drive this and uh, use it internally. And the fact that it is standardized makes it easy for us to uh, execute our joint venture projects with com other companies that happen to also be using 5926. It almost becomes a plug and play affair at that point. So that was a very compelling reason for us to, yeah, to participate in this. And then um, it's kind of the message we've been giving out basically says, well, use 5926 internally first to really get your hands around it. And then the, to use it between companies becomes a lot easier at that point. The actual components and deliverables of the project beyond the documentation um, are is the software, and uh, it's made up of the adapter, which is on the left side here, which connects to your existing application, and it exposes uh, its facade through a web service on the internet, and uh, the, the key other key tools 
our, is the uh, RDS WIP editor, and then we have the iRing mapping editor. So both of these make the connections onto the reference data service. This is for managing and extending content of reference data, and this is for managing the mapping between the model and your uh, system schemas. From a technical aspect, uh, the bulk of the code was based on uh, the .NET framework. However, the, the interface service is actually a Java Joseki solution that uh, is actually used at various other points within the, um, the reference data service itself. Um, and uh, together, uh, all of this makes up, yeah, the iRing uh, deliverable. Uh, at the Fiat Tech conference, uh, we started uh, things off with uh, the pre a presentation. Some of you probably were there and seen it. Um, along with that, uh, there is uh, there was a video that was made of the demo itself, and it's at this link. I won't run it now, but uh, um, it, this, these slides, I imagine, would be on the Fiat Tech website, so you'll probably get access to the actual uh, video that uh, uh, ENR had had done. So the, the demonstration itself, the way that it operated was, well, the goals of it were to, to demonstrate iRing in 59.26 live over the internet. So one of the key requirements that it, we couldn't kind of stick it in a laptop and claim victory. No, it had to actually be on the internet and run across uh, the globe. So you can see here the following companies that were involved in the demonstration and their locations. So we had Hatch in Brisbane, Bechtel was in Frederick, CCC was in Athens, uh, DuPont was in Wilmington, Dow was in Houston, Intergraph was in Huntsville, and Emerson was in Pune. Now, uh, these were the data centers where the people themselves were in other locations uh, accessing their data centers and their iRing adapters um, from various uh, spots. Um, the other thing about it too was to also showcase that we're going between different vendor products. So it's not just that it's live on the internet, but that we're actually using, in this case, Hatch used plant space, uh, Bentley's plant space uh, P&ID. Oh, that doesn't say it. It's plant space P&ID. Need to fix that. Um, the, then Bechtel used uh, uh, Bentley's open plant P, uh, power P&ID. Uh, CCC used their own proprietary C3D uh, model, 3D modeling visualization software. Um, DuPont used Bentley's uh, Power p and the Open Plant p and product. Dow used Smart Plant uh, p and from Intergraph. And Intergraph used uh, their own Smart Plant Foundation. So here we're kind of transitioning f across um, p and systems, 3D systems, and data warehouse systems. And then X, uh, Emerson used Excel for their data sheets. That's um, is the standard form that they used. So we had a good diversity of products. Uh, then we'll go into the actual data flows. So here again, uh, the way it started up was Hatch sent data from Brisbane to Houston to Dow. Uh, we demonstrated within the product uh, the information as it looked on a P&ID, and then once it came into Dow, they opened up Smart Plant P&ID, and you could see the data updating uh, as it went into it. And a similar um, exchange occurred from Bechtel from Frederick to Houston. Uh, then data flow number two uh, was from the P9D data going into uh, Smart Plant Foundation uh, from Intergraph, kind of simulating an owner operator handover scenario. Um, and what uh, Intergraph did is they showed not only the data coming into the repository and you could navigate it through a tree, but they would also click on it and you could access the information through a 3D uh, representation of it from from a, a 3D model that they had used that actually CCC was also using. And um, so you can kind of navigate from a tree into the model and then drive through the model to, to get to that P&ID information. Uh, then the, the third uh, demonstration or data flow was with, uh, again, Hatch, Bechtel, and CCC. And this was where the P&ID was actually going into a 3D model. And as it went into that model, um, it would they had rules set up so that the data, uh, if it hit a certain threshold, for example, your, for example, if it was high temperature, um, the, the color of the pipe would be red, um, or if, uh, you know, various rules would be embedded to change the color of pipe and steel and whatnot. Um, then, then uh, they actually did some statusing, simulated uh, 
uh, delivery of, of uh, uh, certain pieces of uh, material, such as spools uh, and steel and whatnot, and, uh, and then did some hydro test statusing and sent that data back uh, to Bechtel to load into um, um, the, the database application. Um, so it kind of showed a round tripping from PID into 3D model and then into this uh, list management uh, database. Okay, uh, the the fourth demonstration uh, involved uh, the PNIDs going into a data sheet. So uh, that went to Emerson, and uh, again, it was uh, the sheets that were used of the PNID were two different sheets, so different aspects, and uh, captured. In this case, it was a vortex uh, flow meter which was the uh, center of focus. And it went from Bersman, Frederick, uh, to Pune, India. Um, and the last data flow, uh, one of the things about web services in general, if you deploy them to the internet, that's quite a challenge. Uh, you have, it's not a technical challenge, it's actually pretty easy to do that, but it, there's a, a lot of security policy that you need to coordinate within your company. Uh, for example, in Bechtel, it took us six weeks to, to orchestrate the proper um, documents, procedures, and whatnot to meet policy to deploy uh, our I-Ring adapter to the Internet. So what we wanted to demonstrate here is how you could use I-Ring, uh, no differently than if it's deployed on the Internet, but use it by just a simple file transfer. So DuPont, what they did is they um, used, uh, again, the Power P ID from Bentley, um, brought the data into their iron adapter, and then there's an export command that creates what's called an RDF file. Then um, they used uh, Gmail to attach that RDF file to it and sent it over to Bechtel. We, we got the Gmail, we opened it up, and uh, loaded through the import command on iRing into the, uh, the Bechtel iRing adapter, and then, and then went ahead and did a pull from it into our database application. And that, that showed how you could use iRing uh, without having to actually deploy or poke out of your firewall the web service. You could use it completely privately and use email or FTP or even a CD through um, regular mail. So um, again, that, to ease the uh, implementation challenges. Okay, so at this point I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the reference date itself. So that those that was a demonstration. That was uh, um, again it happened in Vegas, and I, I I think it was very successful. All of those data flows that we had planned to do had worked, um, and it was a very enjoyable experience. So on the reference data itself, you've seen that it's distributed. Now conceptually, there there are two main uh, aspects to the reference data. Uh, one is that. Uh, it is physically distributed. It's a single entity. There's one reference data, but it is distributed on various databases. And there's also uh, levels of standardization is the other aspect to it. So the way this works is that we have the ISO set, and then we have the POS CSER, which is a standard organization. They're set, and together when you use the editors of iRing, either the RDS with better or the mapping editor, it will see the reference data as a single entity, so when you search, you're searching across these databases. Uh, for the project, we implemented uh, a sandbox, which started off as empty, and what, what it's there for is that as you use the reference data, you do discover that you need to extend, either add some classes or, or create a template, if you cannot find it in the existing set. And what you do with that is that you create it in your sandbox, which you determine how visible that is, like how many companies or people can actually look in the sandbox. You can make it read only to the world or you can make it re read writable to just one individual. That's, that's very discretionary and self-determined. But again, through the tools, um, you, you list that endpoint for that sandbox in it and it sees the reference data as one entity. So even though it's separated, it's separated by levels of standardization, it's, it's a proprietary contribution initially, and it's physically separated, you, you get to interact with it as it was one, one item. Um, now, the other aspect is that there is this uh, certification request process. So you can, at some point in using the reference data, you would, you would you know, if you're new to it, you would probably not have much confidence about your own extensions. You might wonder, like, wow, is that really a good, a good contribution? So, uh, but after a while, you use it in business, it's adding value to, to your needs. 
then um, you may decide, well, actually, it is a very good uh, extension. I'm going. I would like to move it up, and you can move it. You can escalate it. Either you can even send it directly to ISO if you chose, or you can bring it to Pasteur or any other organization that could certify that. Um, then we are, are planning to put together this this idea of the global sandbox. There's another project starting up after Camelot called Avalon that's tasked with establishing this. And the idea here is that you can at least submit it into into this global sandbox, which will allow it to to live on forever um, as a, um, um, yeah, a read-only extension to anybody that would like to use it. So this is sort of the concept and how we, we would use the reference data uh, of 15926. And again, the iRing software is built to, um, for this type of distribution. Now, the information model itself, yeah, I, I underlined the word initial because it was the first time we used templates to actually build this thing. And it was for the demonstration. It's a bit complex looking at this level, um, but it is a significant deliverable from the project, and it's what will continue to expand and grow uh, beyond Camelot. So uh, as we begin to use iRing in our company, we, we will want to add more um, you know, widen the flow of information through it. And uh, that's just the natural uh, way that you use 15926. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's a very key uh, part of, uh, of the solution as a whole. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little more technically into this and uh, go into the details. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the iRing tools. Um, so the first stuff is Say, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me, Robin. slide that shows the, the two editors and how they work and the modules that are in place. So you can see the reference data down here on the right. And we have, again, the RDS WIP editor and the iRing mapping editor. So the role uh, of the RDS WIP editor is to manage and extend, uh, oh, browse, really, search, um, reference data content. And the role of the iRing mapping editor is to, is to um, create the mapping between your system and the information model sitting in the reference data. You'll notice that they both use the same common um, module. It's called the iRing Reference Data Service. And this is what allows you to do these queries across the whole set, across the globe. Uh, and it also allows you to read and write into the appropriate sandboxes that you own, you know, via access control. So this particular module, the iRing uh, Reference Data Service, is a key service that supports the, the roles of uh, uh, editing and mapping. Now, the adapter service is actually where the transformation engine uh, lives, uh, and this would be distributed on, against every system. Um, and the iRing Mapping Editor is preparing the map for its operation, in essence, and will bring in specific model data into the map file and persist it there. Okay, so this next set of slides is going to kind of show how the actual exchange works. And there's, uh, there's two main modes. It's really a, a, a pull mode or a push. Um, and uh, what we implemented in demo was the pull, pull side of the operation. There's, a, there's a, a software piece of software we built called the Demo Control Panel that was used just for the demonstration in Las Vegas. Uh, it was designed just to make it easy to call the various um, um, interfaces that are on these uh, on the iRing adapters. So the way this works for the refresh, this is where you publish your data. So you have your data; it's work in progress inside your legacy database. And at some point, you decide, okay, I'm ready to make my information public, so other other companies or systems can consume it. So you, you, you call the, the publishing command on the adapter, and through the mapping, it knows how to grab that information out of its database and transform it into a 5096 representation, and then it sticks it into what's called the triple store. So it's actually a database, and this database is the interface. This is what um, you actually, how you fetch data from other companies through this exposed triple store, and this sits on the uh, internet. Um, and, and of course, every other endpoint would do the same thing. They would publish their information. So when a, the exchange takes place, the flow of information is, um, in this case, from right to left. And uh, what happens is that this, this side, the left side, wants information from another company. 
So through the adapter, there's a special type of query called the Sparkle query that's launched against the, their interface service that then goes in and fetches out the data that's, that's uh, been published in their triple store and returns it into their adapter service, which then through the Mac again, knows how to transform it into uh, the right um, yeah, representation for the legacy system. So this is the pull, and again, this is what was used in the demo. Now the other, other aspect of it is the push, where we want to support messaging. So this is a little bit going for the future where we anticipate the use of uh, middleware to facilitate a lot of these and orchestrate a lot of these uh, information flows. So um, in this case, um, the adapter takes part to develop the message itself, which I believe is in the form of an RDF file, that then would get sent over to uh, the interface service of some other endpoint, and it would store it in its triple store, but in a special area that could only be read by that that receiving company. There's no other way a company could poke inside this inbox and extract information out of it. So that's the push, and it's a two-step process. So in other words, various companies may be pushing messages or even content information into your uh, iRing adapter, and then at your discretion, you can examine it using, again, the same mapping service to then load it into your legacy system. So it allows you to capture messages and uh, bring them in. It's kind of like an email concept. Okay, so the components of uh, the iRing adapter itself, um, they, uh, they're divided up in, into modules, and the reason why this is done is to allow um, other technology implementations to interface into the various open source parts of it. So all of this is open source software. It's all free, downloadable, and you could use it directly, and this is designed to attach to any type of, uh, yeah, entity framework supported data source. So SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, and so on and so forth. Um, but you may have another case where you have a server that has an API that's proprietary to that design. So that what you do in that case is you take this data layer component, and then that needs to be written specifically for that a particular API. So you don't have to go against the database. You can go against the application server, access its business rules, and still be able to uh, use the iRing. In fact, any one of these modules you could replace with your own technology. Um, what's, what is the actual protocol? It sits over here on the right, um, and that is a part of the, yeah, the iRing 5096 standard, and its semantic web standard for that matter. So. Um, it's a very flexible. Uh, these, these boundaries are themselves uh, treated as standards that are unique to iRing, um, but they will be maintained and extended and guaranteed backward uh, forward compatible. Um, so that, again, as you assess for a software development company, you can assess how much of this you would make your own, whatever makes sense. Okay, so um, now we're getting into the, the uh, acknowledgement side of the project. These are all the people, it's a bit of an eye chart, but these are all the people that have worked in some capacity on the project itself. And uh, there's quite a few names there. So again, you'll, you can download this and read that. Uh, the next thing is uh, Camelot did depend on consultants, and these consultants were made up from these companies. They were all volunteered their time. So these are the individuals that were the experts in their area. Some of these folks, like Ono and Magna and Johan, are authors of 5096 themselves. Um, um, so the, I, I would say the project would have not been successful without these individuals uh, making their contributions and bringing in their expertise. And then the, the last is the, what I kind of call the core set, the core of Camelot. Uh, these folks really uh, were pretty much full-time engaged in this project and uh, really were the ones responsible for making it a success. Um, so again, these are the, the folks from uh, Bechtel, Bentley, CCC Hatch, NRX, TCS, and Zachary. The thing I want to point out about Zachary is that Zachary uh, kind of discovered Camelot as a project in iRing uh, at the Las Vegas demo, and they were very impressed uh, with what the project had delivered at that point in time, 
and they also realized that it was very well aligned to their own business goals uh, and implementation plan. So they, they immediately, uh, right, right, at, right when we got back from Vegas, they called us up and said, hey, we have a full-time programmer for you. Which, could you use him? And so that was uh, Bill Craddeville. And said, absolutely, that would be great. That would help us uh, work on the remainder, remaining scope. And it turned out Bill actually is a, a very strong expert on, on .NET um, patterns and practices. And I think that had a big influence on the design of uh, the, the editors and uh, was a really good uh, result, uh, getting that participation at the latter part of the project. So, um, this, again, these are the folks that uh, really rolled up their sleeves in a big way and, um, and just drove this uh, project to success. Now, there's a new project coming up. So this is, this is, this is me going to advertise. Uh, in fact, this project kicks off tomorrow. If you have any questions about it, send me an email. I'll send you the plan. Um, it's really the idea is, hey, let's take the energy that, that uh, was in Camelot and uh, um, start up a new project with, with the, these two main goals. Establish a scalable um, uh, reference data service uh, and, um, and also to, uh, to manage um, the, uh, the hiring software. So if I kind of go through the objectives, to define, deliver, scalable ISO 596 WIP. So we have, we have that today, but we expect the usage to escalate uh, with the availability of iRing and, and a lot of other initiatives that are happening. So we really want to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, really scale out the, the reference data system. And uh, the other uh, objective is to provide a place for a lot of existing initiatives on reference data work to collaborate and to also spread the knowledge. So it's a little bit of a, it's, well, it's not a little bit, it's a lot about sharing knowledge on 5096 and, um, um, collaborating or providing inter-initiative inter collaboration. Um, and then the, the, the third is, a, is a, more sm it's a smaller component of Avalon, but it's just to set up the uh, software control board to manage the quality and direction of the iRing technology. Okay, so the time frame of Avalon is June 10th, and it will end on November 20th. Again, the main deliverable is the uh, scalable service. And this is what um, Avalon looks like. This is kind of highlighting the second objective. Uh, this is an example of existing initiatives that uh, various companies have. We were, we've actually already begun a lot of this inter-company coordination on reference data. The whole idea is that we all have different initiatives today, and um, if we share the work, we could share the knowledge, and we could share the actual resources to do it. So in other words, if Emerson comes in with a bunch of uh, requirements for instrumentation, and we have similar or a subset of that, then why don't we just do it together, then we'll teach, teach each other how to do it, and uh, we'll, we'll reduce our actual uh, scope for it. And all of this will start to expand out that 5926 information model. And yeah, Avalon does have its end date, but this activity, there's an operation component that continues, and then there is the... Uh, um, the continuing of the collaboration and hiring management. And this is what Avalon looks like. It's a little more of a busy slide. Um, but again, this is in the project plan, so we can uh, explain that in future uh, web webinars and whatnot. So the takeaways from this webinar are, yeah, hiring uh, version 1.0 is available now. That's the address. You can click on it. You can start, uh, there's documents on there you can start to look at. And the software is there, and the source code is there, right? Yep. Um, and uh, the Avalon project starts on June 10th, so uh, get the iRing. So a uh, question here, is iRing based on middleware technology? And I think that might just be what, what you define as middleware technology, Robin, but... Yeah, so I, I guess it's, it's based on several technologies. Uh, the, at, at, at the upper end, there's the semantic web technology such as uh, RDF and uh, OWL, Sparkle, and Triple Stores. Um, then a uh, next layer down, it's mixed between uh, Java and .NET. And the reason why it's mixed is that uh, partly because we, we already had part of the solution. 
the interface service, let me back up a little bit to that slide. Uh, right, right here. So the interface service here is based on Java, and uh, the, the bulk of it is based on .NET, and that uses uh, WCF, WF, and uh, any others? Am I missing some? Yeah, so those, those are the technologies. So I, I, I would say that that's kind of the middle where technology is used. But keep in mind, this is an adapter. It's, it's an endpoint. It is not typical middleware such as uh, like, like a BizTalk and those kinds of things. There, there's probably, well, there, there definitely is a need for that to come, and uh, we need 15926 or semantic web-enabled middleware. And we're working with various software vendors. You know, we have the usual folks that, are, that we talk with a lot, like the Bentleys and Intergraphs and InterXs and whatnot. But we also talked to Microsoft and IBM about this, and um, we would like them to deliver some um, 5926 middleware. Okay, um, with a peer-to-peer -peer environment, how do you address security such as export, export controls? I mean, ex export controls as far as um, like well, ECCNs, I'm, I'm, if, it's, if it's ECCNs, uh, then uh, yeah, this is open source software. I'm not really sure how that, actually that is controlled. Well, if, you're about, if you're talking about access control on the, on the information itself, uh, the current version of iRing does not have it, um, access control layer put into it yet. That, that's a task that will follow up, um, again, through the open source, through the existing collaboration. We're going to continue to, to, to work on that. So um, um, that, that will, uh, will come in later. I, I'm not sure if I answered that question correctly. But that, that question came on earlier in the presentation, too, and you may have addressed it when you were talking about doing the demos and being able to export it through Google and working through, didn't you say through Bechtel, you said it had taken six weeks to kind of work with the firewall issues? And well, yeah, that, that's a slightly different aspect. That's just, uh, you, every company has their policy about exposing any kind of web service or website to the internet, and it, you have to satisfy your company's uh, security policies. Um, and, and yeah, so your experience will vary on that. Um, for Bechtel, it was very, very rigorous, and um, so it, it took some effort and time to do it, but we, it managed to do it, and it's good. Um, uh, Rob, Rob is on, uh, if, I think he can uh, share his desktop now, I believe. Okay. Okay, you're, 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 you're it. I just gave control. Rob, uh, Robin, another quick question. Someone wanted to know if there's a relation between what we're doing here with ISO 15926 and any of the work being done with BIM or IFC um, in the commercial sector. Are you aware of? Well, I think the software vendors could speak to that from the commercial side. Um, but I do know that there are existing uh, collaboration efforts between the various standards and the natural thing to do, as I pointed out in the slide, was to harmonize uh, those standards. So BIM would be IFCs, um, and so you want to do uh, uh, harmonization of IFC into 5926, um, and then there's AEX and so on and so forth. So there's, there's many different activities that are, are trying to yeah, interoperate between the interoperating standards. I'm trying to show my screen, but... We're seeing it, okay. iRing Mapping Editor. Okay, this is, yeah, so this is the iRing Mapping Editor. Um, I don't know <clears throat> where. So um, this, this really is the primary user interface for, uh, for the adapter and how to control it and, uh, and map. And the primary task of the adapter is to take data that's in your legacy system, which here is described as a pane here called data object. So I've got some tables and a SQL Server database. Uh, I've got four different tables here. I'm going to interrupt Rob. Um, uh, Rob, what, what what kind of technology was used to make this editor? Silverlight. Thank you. Okay. I couldn't hear the answer, Robin. <clears throat> Silverlight. Silverlight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is a, a Microsoft uh, rich app rich Internet application framework. Thank okay, you. so 
these are the data objects that are available. And uh, so these are, like, these are the, the tables in my application. And what I want to do is map them now to the, to the 15.6 model. And so the way that we wanted to allow people to interact with the model was through uh, basic searching. So in this case, I have a line. And um, let's say I wanted to map it to uh, uh, something in the model. So this is uh, piping. Uh, I know it's a piping network. I happen to know where I'm headed. So this helps a little bit. Uh, but I could look for piping network system, and it would bring up things that match up. I yeah, so at this point, Rob actually did this federated search across a couple of repositories, from the POSSES or the WIP RDS and the Sandbox. Yeah. So what we have here that we're looking at here are um, classes and templates from the, from the 15926 model that's coming out of both the Sandbox and uh, the actual RDS WIP. Uh, in this case, the piping network system class is something that's out of the RDS web. Um, and if we open that up, we can see uh, it takes a bit for it to fetch up the definition of that class. And then once it does, I can look at things like its superclass and subclass, so it's on, this would be its ontology. Uh, or I can look at its templates, which would be more like its information model. And that's really what I'm after. I'm looking for what kind of properties or relationships can I map to that are on uh, a piping network type system. And so now I'm fetching up the list of templates. Uh, there's a little spinner up here in the top right. Uh, you're kind of like our hourglass. And in this case, uh, let's say I want to look at piping network system name. And that, that's a template. And now it's fetching the definition of that template. Um, now inside this uh, information model window, what I'm doing is I'm actually looking at the, the model. I'm looking at all the definition that's in there, that's in the sandbox and in the RDS whip. Um, and so this is the content that Avalon will be looking to extend and enhance and, and grow. So on this template, there are three roles. So a role is uh, kind of like, a, I guess, a sub-property, right? So templates essentially, like this is a property template but this property has uh, bits and pieces about it that you might uh, want to talk about. So for example, a nominal diameter template, if I was to load that one up, you could see that there's a, a property as well as for the value and a, and a role for the value and a role for the, um, for the unit of measure. Uh, with the name, it's more simple, but it's really just the identifier that I'm, I'm interested in. Okay. Uh, so in this case, uh, I've already gone and mapped this for the sake of time to show that I have a, a line that's mapped to piping network system name, and uh, I have the identifier mapped. And uh, as, as you click on these things, you're, you're really binding the data object and the thing that you're mapping to, uh, to the actual map that's in your data set. So here, if I click on identifier, I can see that I have this role um, that is mapped to a specific property called tag, okay, and I can see the data, the data type, and we have some other advanced features that are uh, actually coming later, uh, things like doing value lists and things like that for um, uh, units of measure and things like, uh, and, and like, like that. So um, after you save your mapping, uh, you would then uh, do what we call generate, which is going to um, really set up the dynamic uh, data access on the service. So the service, and this is the adapter service, um, is a uh, uh, RESTful, RESTful data service. So if I was to say, show me the lines that are on my service, uh, I can, oh, thank you, Monica. I keep hitting the wrong, I'm just typing the wrong thing in. So it's totally user error. So <laughs> So if you type in, uh, you say, give me the, the lines that are on my service, I can see that I have four lines in my database. And if I was to open up SQL Server, you can see the same thing. Um, and I can actually ask for one of these lines. And unfortunately, the only property that I have mapped at this point is the, um, is the tag. So you can see the tag. Um, and um, I could go to... Um, I could then say, give me this in what we call QXF. And QXF is a, uh, an XML container that approximates uh, the representation of, of triples. So 
in reality, when we store it in a triple store, it gets put in there as uh, as raw triples, and the typical way that you would exchange that is through RDF. But because of limitations uh, for, with the technologies of Microsoft and being able to expose data, I need a fixed class. And RDF is not a fixed class. It's uh, the schema of that XML is dependent on, on the actual data. So if I do this, I get the QXF for this one line. And uh, if I wanted to, I could uh, refresh. Um, I can refresh the line and put it into the triple store. Um, let me do that really quick. So I'm going to actually put all the lines in the triple store. So those lines are now in the triple store, and uh, I can come here and, and query out. I'm just going to query all the triples. This is a uh, a quick hack. So these, this is all the data that I just generated and put into the triple store. So this includes uh, the, the life cycle of this particular of each particular template um, and, uh, and and the data. So these are all the triples, and and it's this Sparkle query that that we're uh, you would typically interface with the service, but the service will generate all of these queries for you. Uh, we generate all the queries required to put this data into the triple store, but it, it, additionally, uh, if you tell the service to go and pull data from another um, another endpoint, what it will do is base its queries on its own mapping, and it will get the data back in a, in a format that it understands and will be able to just put it into your legacy system. So uh, what I want to point out here is that Rob is showing you a little bit or a lot under the hood stuff. You You don't really... If you're a software developer, you will probably engage in this, but if you're just a typical uh, end user, you wouldn't. You'd be looking at this side here. Um, so iRing, what it's doing is it's, it's putting um, a wrapper on top of the complexity that's underneath so that you don't really have to deal with 1596 in its raw form or the semantic web technologies in their raw form. So don't, don't be alarmed if uh, what you saw Certain aspects of it were a little bit shocking. <laughs> Say, Robin, we do have a few people writing in for the same question, which is around the issue of um, version or revision controls. Um, wondering how does this system validate or take into account um, changes um, when you're exchanging with with a second party? Well, the the information that's inside the uh, the endpoint is lifecycle information. So as you publish your data into it, the iRing adapter will automatically um, look to see if that if that, that data you're publishing in already exists. And if it does, then it, it will terminate that data date on there. That's how you kind of create the lifecycle state of information. Um, and it will continue to accumulate various publications. So as on the other end, as you query it, you can query for the current information or you could query for all of it, or maybe some point in time in the past. It's a function of how you um, how you issue that actual query itself. Great, and um, maybe just to somewhat wrap up here, we're we're losing a lot of people here at the lunch hour. But uh, how how should people um, get involved if they want training in how to use the software? Uh, is that something that they should contact you for? Yeah. Well, there there is no. Um, yeah, I guess there's no ex actual project or service today that will train you on iRing software because it's very new. It just came out. Um, but there is the Avalon project that, again, is focused on establishing um, a scalable reference data service. But there is that component of collaborating between the companies on their usage of reference data and naturally with the iRing technology. So there's a window of opportunity to get engaged now uh, to gain access to, in essence, the experts that have been involved in this for all this time. Um, but that window will start to close because as demand starts to rise, uh, then, then uh, organizations, well, I don't want to list the names, but there are quite a few organizations out there that will sell you the service of training um, and all other aspects needed to successfully use 1596. So there's a whole consulting thing that will come about. I would imagine that uh, most of the software companies uh, that implement iRing would provide that service. And then there's companies also like TCS and DNV that would also 
provide those types of services. Um, so it's um, it, there's a window of opportunity now to get in, but um, just due to the, the physics of time that and resource availability, that window will close very quickly. All right. Well said. Thank you, Robin. Um, so for those of you that are already um, involved in FIA Tech. Wait, 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 Nicole, let me add one thing. And of course, join FIA Tech and Paw Caesar. That's the other way. Oh, well, that was going to be. <laughs> you, you beat me to it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I don't think we can overemphasize the amount of um, time and dedication and um, companies and individuals that have really, like Robin said, been working around the clock to make this available and to hit um, a very De definite and, and a, a short um, turnaround on a, on a deliverable here. So uh, I think we're all grateful. This is going to be something um, new and revolutionary for the industry. And um, if you want to get involved, it's not too late uh, in the Avalon project starting tomorrow, right? Yep. So uh, thank you again, Robin and Rob and Julian and Manoj, um, who are on the call. Um, as well as all the others. And uh, hopefully by the end of today, we will have this presentation, uh, links of course to the um, actual software. There's also a press release that was just issued last night that most all of you should have received. It's also on our, our FIATEC website. Um, and a recording of, of the audio from, from this presentation on the FIATEC site as well. So thanks everyone, and uh, hope you all have a happy and productive remainder of the day.